Welcome to chapter 16 of the Canadian Securities Course, volume 2. In this chapter, we are going to be going over the portfolio management process. So the portfolio management process consists of seven different steps. We have determine investment objectives and constraints. Next, we design an investment policy statement. After that, we develop the asset mix, then select the securities and monitor the client, the market, and the economy, evaluate portfolio performance, and rebalance the portfolio. So we're going to go through this process in order, starting with number one, which is determine investment objectives and constraints. So the objective is to determine what rate of return the client will need to attain their goals and what risk they are able to take on. So when determining the investment objectives, you really do need to keep in mind two different things. So first off, you want to check their time horizon. So when will they need the money? If they're a younger investor, then they might have a longer term um, or a longer uh, time horizon for investing. And that would mean you would want some investments that are weighted more into equity, more into the market, since they will have a higher rate of return. Now, despite what the textbook may say, um, if a client is looking to have a higher rate of return and they do have a longer time horizon, the other side of that is you do need to look at sort of the psychology of the investor and how comfortable they are to take on risk. So that is really important as well when determining the investment objectives. Um, and basically, uh, the textbook does define a few different securities. So you do have cash and cash equivalents. That is more of uh, a really safe area. Um, it's usually used as ammo to put into the market when opportunities do arise. And then you also do have fixed income securities, um, which do provide more uh, security um, rather than uh, more return. So along with that, you do have equities and there are actually different risk categories in equities. First off, you have conservative equities. So these are more sort of the... Uh, low risk, high cap stocks. They have predictable earnings, high yields, high dividend payouts, um, and they tend to have lower price to earnings ratio and lower price volatility. So they're those safer stocks. Um, they're those well-known mature stocks usually. Um, and then you also do have the growth category. So this is where you will see some medium risk, um, these companies will have average capitalization and they do have potential for above average growth in earnings. These companies tend to have a bit higher price to earnings ratio and potentially higher price volatility. You also do have ventures. So ventures are high risk, low capitalization stocks. They're often found on something like the TSX venture. Um, and they do have limited earnings record and typically no dividend. The price to earnings ratio for these stocks have little significance and they usually have short operating history and are highly volatile. And the riskiest type of equity is the speculative equities. These have maximum risk, shorter term, and maximum price volatility, meaning that there is that potential for the stock to even go bankrupt. Um, these speculative companies, they tend to have no earnings, no dividends, and the price to earnings ratio is not significant whatsoever. Now, uh, in terms of investment objectives, um, this is really important to sort of understand. Um, there is three different uh, things that you are going to be looking at when you are thinking about investment objectives. First off is safety of principle. So many clients, they do want some assurance that their initial capital investment will remain intact. So if this is your client's goal, you should really help to prevent this um, regardless of the return generated. So to do this, you may want to put them in a more secure investment or maybe you would want to put them into a special type of fund, maybe a segregated fund or a market link GIC or something like that. So basically, if the client does um, have high importance for safety of principle, then they will have to accept a lower rate of return. 
Now, some clients also do want regular income, um, and this is basically just a cash flow received um, often from debt and equity securities, so bonds and some dividends from equities. And the major considerations here are the taxation of dividends and interest income. So obviously dividends are taxed um, more favorably um, than interest. And then you also do have growth as an investment objective. And this typically refers to capital gains generated when securities are sold for more than the original cost. Now, each type of security, they do have their own place within these investment objectives. Um, you do have short-term bonds. These provide the best safety, but limited growth, and they are quite steady on income, but it usually is quite low. Now, long-term bonds, they provide the next best safety, but um, the growth, again, is usually quite low. It is variable, and the income tends to be uh, quite steady, a bit more than short-term bonds, um, but still not super high. Preferred shares... They tend to have pretty good safety. Um, there isn't too much growth. There can be some capital appreciation, but usually not much. And the income usually is quite steady. They usually do pay a pretty steady dividend. Now, common shares, they have the least amount of safety. They do fluctuate the most. They have the most risk to them. Um, and the income, it really does vary. So some common shares may offer dividends. Some may not. Um, and also there is that possibility that the dividend may be cut or um, even gone altogether. Now, common shares, the benefit here is they really are high in the growth. You have a high possibility of growth with common, st common stock. Um, so if growth is important to you, then common shares might be the way to go. Now, the second um, goal or the second step to the uh, portfolio approach is designing an investment policy statement. So this typically refers to a new account application form um, or a KYC, know your client form. It's basically an agreement between a portfolio manager and a client and it provides investment guidelines for that manager. Um, so things that these usually do include um, are operating rules and guidelines, asset allocation, uh, investment objectives and constraints, um, and maybe even a schedule for portfolio reviews and things like that. Um, so this is really important to have. It sort of does um, show you the guidelines for that specific client, um, and it will help you build their portfolio. So, so step number three is develop the asset mix. And of course, you do have various different uh, types of assets. You have the cash and cash equivalents, which we did go over. Um, these are often currency, money market securities, redeemable GICs or bonds with maturity of one year or less. And usually you will have at least 5% of a diversified portfolio in bonds. Um, if someone is looking to be safer you might have 10 percent, but that usually is sort of the max in cash uh, fixed in income securities these consist of bonds um, due in more than one year um, and then also the purpose is to produce an income and provide some safety now uh, the amount allocated depends on the client's needs for income over capital gains and also their needs for safety over return um, so it does vary. And then equity securities, these consist of ETFs, mutual funds, convertible bonds, and convertible preferred shares. The main purpose is to generate capital gains. So you will see a lot of growth within equity securities, um, like stocks and things like that. Um, so they are more risky than the other two, but they will tend to provide you higher returns in the long run. Now, asset class timing is sort of a way that some managers try to uh, improve returns by strategically switching from stocks to T-bills and then to bonds back to stocks. Basically, they are timing um, the economic market um, based on its current cycle. So, for example, if we are into a contraction phase, which means we hit the top of the market and now we're going down, um, 
so this typically does look like uh, recession conditions and also we tend to have higher interest rates at this time basically the strategy for this is to lengthen uh, your term of bond holdings so maybe uh, sell your short term bonds and buy long term bond bonds also you will want to reduce your stock exposure because stocks tend to decrease in recession conditions as well and since the interest rates are high um, you will want to lengthen that uh, term of the bond holdings because typically they will begin to decrease if they're too high meaning that the price of these bonds will end up going up um, and you don't want that you want to buy them when they are low now the second equity cycle is the stock market tro um, this is basically the end of the contraction phase it's basically the bottom of the market um, so this is when you sell those long-term bonds and you're just going to want to buy stocks um, since they will benefit from the recovery. So if you think of COVID-19 when the market was at the bottom, that's when you are going to want to put stocks into your portfolio since they will benefit from that recovery. Um, and the recovery and expansion, this is when the economy starts growing. Again, just increase your common stocks since they will benefit from this. Now the equity cycle peak is when you reach that peak of the expansion and typically um, this will be followed by the contraction phase. Um, so you will want to reduce common stock and invest in short term bonds um, and then once the contraction phase begins again, again sell those T-bills. Uh, lengthen the bond holdings and reduce some stock exposure so it sort of is a cycle now asset class timing it is quite difficult to do and some managers do try to do it and they do have some success but but uh, it, it definitely is difficult to time the market now asset allocation is another thing that uh, managers really do look at when they are developing the asset mix and it basically means that you're trying to get the asset mix right. Um, so the percentage of cash, fixed income, and equities in the portfolio. And it is more important to get this asset allocation right than to outperform in a specific asset group. Now, there are two different types of asset allocation. You have dynamic asset allocation and tactical asset allocation. The difference here is that dynamic asset allocation is when you adjust the asset mix basically systematically to rebalance the portfolio based um, on its long-term target. So when a portfolio does sort of get out of balance by uh, just, for example, stocks are performing higher than bonds, um, so the, the market value of your stocks will increase and it, your uh, portfolio will end up being overweighted in stocks. So the dynamic asset allocation will fix this. It will sort of sell some stocks, buy more fixed income when it does become a bit out of balance. Now the tactical asset allocation allows you to capitalize on investment opportunities. So again, it sort of does use that asset class timing um, because it will allow you to capitalize on these opportunities depending on where we are in the economic cycle. So, for example, if we are uh, lower in the market, if we're at that uh, market bottom, then uh, managers that do take this tactical asset allocation style, they will uh, stock up more on uh, stocks in order to uh, have some more returns when the market does uh, recover. So they'll do this rather than reverting back to that long-term strategic asset allocation. So for step number four, basically you just select the securities. So here you're gonna be selecting specific stocks and bonds or managed products to include in the client's portfolio. And it is extremely important to make sure that the securities chosen match the client's investment objective. So that's the main um, takeaway from step number four. Step number five is monitor the client, the market, and the economy. So um, obviously monitoring the client, it just means staying informed about your client's objectives and just make sure they aren't changing too much and update them regularly when they do. Um, if there are significant changes, you should complete an amended NAF. Now monitoring the market, um, it basically means that you're looking to anticipate changes 
um, in the portfolio to reflect both on return expectations and objectives of the client. So you will want to monitor where the market is going um, to make sure it isn't changing too much um, for your client's objectives. Um, because capital markets, they do constantly evolve um, and change. So you will need to stay up to date on that to make sure they don't change too much that it will sort of affect your client's objectives. Monitoring the economy just means monitoring all information that may affect each asset class. Step number six is evaluate the portfolio performance. So often um, you will do a portfolio review every six months at least um, or every year. Um, and usually the portfolio is compared to other similar portfolios or even a benchmark. Um, now, as we talked about in the last chapter, um, in this you will really look at the total return. Um, so that is a really important measure to uh, evaluate based on other indexes or other portfolios like that. Um, and then risk adjusted rate of, turn, rate of return is another measure that uh, is really important. It shows how much risk in is involved to produce a specific return. And often a way to calculate this is the sharp ratio. So this, the sharp ratio, it is calculated as the return on uh, a portfolio minus the risk free return, often a T bill return. And then you'll divide that by the standard deviation of the portfolio. Now, a higher sharp ratio is typically better. Um, it shows that you have higher returns for um, based on how much risk you do have. So step number seven is rebalancing the portfolio. And this is basically the process of reallocating assets back to their originally intended portfolio weights. Um, we also talked about this in uh, another step where we talked about the dynamic asset allocation versus the tactical asset allocation. Um, so uh, basically you'll take one of those two. If you are using that dynamic asset allocation, you are going to be um, basically rebalancing the portfolio uh, periodically whenever it does become a little bit too much overweighted in one area. Um, in this chart here, it does show um, uh, that 10 years later, when but after you do uh, set that first asset allocation, it becomes a little bit too much overweighted in stocks. And that is because stocks tend to have higher returns. So over time, they will tend to grow faster than the bonds and the cash, and they'll take up a higher percentage of your portfolio. Um, now, the risk here is that in 10 years time, the objectives of your client, they probably haven't changed too much or at least they haven't changed to be more risky typically they do change to be safer um, so if you don't adjust it it doesn't match your clients objectives at the time that's why it is really important to rebalance the portfolio and uh, just stay up to date on that part of it anyway that is all of the important topics in chapter 16 of the canadian securities course so i hope you guys found this review helpful again i am going to be going into the next chapter shortly so stay tuned for that